Today I'm starting a new series. Turn down just a little bit. We're starting a new series, and I'm, I'm going to be talking about the, the theme of generous. Generous. I love to be around generous people. Amen. There's just something about being around generous people that uh, it just gets on you. It's exciting, you know, because th- they, they have something in their heart to give. They're, they're thinking about touching others. They're, they're thinking about others beyond them, themselves. You know, that, that's really the heart of God. That's his DNA. You know that, don't you? It is. You know, I, I really don't like to be around stingy people. Stingy people or greedy people because all they care about is themselves, right? Can we be just at, at least acknowledge the fact that greedy people are great? Are you listening? Greedy people are not great. They're not fun to be with. Generous people are awesome to be around, right? They really are. Acts 20, 35, Paul is, is writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says, I showed you that by this kind of hard work that we must help the weak. We must help the weak. And then he says this, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself said. Oh, now you're gonna pull out the big guns. You're just not speaking under the unction of the Holy Spirit, but now you're gonna use the words of Jesus. Right, Jesus said. You wanna know what Jesus said? He said this, he said, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. You're more blessed to be generous than you are greedy. Right? Now there's nothing wrong with receiving and there are times that we need to receive. There are times that we need to submit. Uh, You know, we're going through a hardship and I tell you what, when you're going through a hardship but you're walking in faith that God's gonna meet your need and then all of a sudden the supply comes to meet your need, then your pride wells up and says, well, I can't accept that. And then you try to rob somebody of a blessing. Stop it. When you're in a time of need and you've been standing in faith and here comes the provision, what do you say? You say, thank you so much. You are an answer to our prayer. That's how we receive generosity from other people. And if we don't know how to receive generosity from other people, then people can't be very generous, can they? Because all of a sudden there's all these dams around them and they can't give to people and help people in times of need. He said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Matter of fact, your life is better off when you give rather than focus on receiving. When you focus on giving out, when you focus on other people's needs. And it's amazing how we need science to finally come along and prove the Bible right. Okay, but uh, I've got a book that I've been going through. It's called The Paradox of Generosity. And uh, this is really not a a biblical-based book. It is nothing more than just studies on giving, studies on generosity, and and life cases. And um, literally, here's the bottom line. This is what Jesus is saying when it's, you're more blessed to give than receive. The more generous you are, the more contentment, health, and purpose in life that you will have. A lot of people think that, man, if I just have more time and money, I'm going to be happy. There's a lot of people with time and money, and they're not very happy. They're always getting into trouble. They're always causing more drama. You see them on the front of the little magazines as you're going to check out at Walmart. And doesn't that look happy? Now, most of that's Photoshopped and a lot of it's lies, right? Inquiry minds will never really know. But we can also say being selfish, being selfish is nothing more than trying to fulfill an immediate gratification that leads a lasting pain of regret. That's, that's really what uh, selfishness is, whether it's money, you know, compulsive spending and, and hoarding your money and holding on to it and not being generous, or, or maybe it's drinking, maybe it's drugs, maybe it's other life subst- substances, or maybe it's pornography, those things that, that you use to gratify your flesh, and then after the high goes away, you feel the pain, the pain of indulging, and suddenly what do you have to do? You have to repeat the cycle to feel better again. And really, people that have addictive behaviors, and we, you know, I think we all have some tendencies and we have some bends someplace here and there, but people that are struggling with real life addictions are people that, and, and people that are giving into them. They're not willing to get over them. They're some of the most selfish people on the planet. 
because it's all about how they feel and they don't care about how what they feel is affecting other people. That's not being generous. And one of the areas of culture that we talk around here about is we are a generous culture. Generous culture. And so many people default to the simple fact of generosity means money. That's just one part of generosity. And we're going to talk about that part. But there's other parts of generosity we're going to be talking about as far as forgiveness, long-suffering, patience with people. People drop the ball. You don't hit them with a hammer. Right? You love them through it. Now, generosity doesn't mean that we're going to enable bad habits. There's a difference, right? But when we look at this, the word generosity or generous refers to the fact of being noble or having a noble spirit. The thought of being associated with high birth or royalty. Now, we're in our republic, our democratic society, and we really don't connect too well with a theocracy of, you know, kingdom rule. And we are far dismissed from it. And even though kingdom, uh, England still has a theocracy, it's ruled by parliament. Queen has very little say in much of the matters, okay? So if we could rewind the clock even further, really the theocracy is there that it would separate high birth or those of noble caste, those of a certain patents of bloodline, uh, that they are better than these people, the commoners, the pond scum. And then we Americans come along, we rip all that up and say, we are all equal. We are all created equal, but we all don't act equal. Okay? So when we look at this, we think of being related. We are disassociated from this, this fact of noble birth or being related to royalty. But let me tell you something. When you're born again, you're born into a kingdom. And we have a king, the high king, Jesus Christ, our king of kings and lord of lords. You understand that? And when we are born again, we are made new and we are to take on his DNA. We are to take on his likeness. We are to take on the kingdom culture, not our culture. Because the culture in America and, 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 and the media that surrounds us is all about accumulation and hoarding. Get, 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 get. And if you give, it hurts. Don't. You'll be at a loss if you give. And then if there is anything on TV that's about giving to help the needy, they use very dramatic ways to get you to give out of guilt, manipulation, compulsion, excitement. The Bible is very clear that we are not to give under compulsion. To be manipulated, to to be worked up, to do something, to act based on the flesh. You understand that? And I am sorry to say that there are some, some of these programs that call themselves Christian TV ministers that give a bad name to those that are really doing kingdom work. And they got the gimmicks and they're selling all kinds of garbage just to extrapolate money. And you say, why are they doing that? Because there's enough ignorant people out there that do it. They give to these ministries. But it doesn't do away with the reality of the need. And so then what happens is people shut down. Well, I'm not going to give to nothing because I can't trust anything. Well, you give to the government. (laughs) Edit that out. (laughs) We, you know, we can talk a lot about what generosity is, but we can, you know, A good old-fashioned country preacher, he said, you can know more about something by what it's not than by what it is. Right? Right? And so I'll tell you what generosity is not. It's not selfish, it's not dishonorable, and it's not poverty mindset. In other words, there's a lot of people with a lot of money that have a poverty mindset. They, They don't want to do anything with their money except hoard it because they live by fear, not by faith. And so when we look at the opposite of generous, we can look at the word miser, which is the root word to misery. Misery. When you are walking in greed, you are going to be most miserable. Some of the most content and happy and fulfilled people I know on this planet are generous people. Even when they're going through the darkest of days, even when they're in the midst of trial and financial challenges, they're like, I don't have to worry because God's my source. 
God's my source. I am not my own source. I am not my own God. I have a God and I honor him. So either you're a generous person or you're not. Right? There's no middle ground. Either you have the virtue to do good things for others freely and abundantly or you don't. And you can't fake generosity because it's an action of love. Now think of it this way. Here's the world's mindset when it comes to giving. Does giving or being generous represent a loss? I mean, if I take this water, and I'm gonna annoy some of you, and pour some of that out, didn't I lose some water? I have less water for me. So in the world's thinking, when we walk by sight, and the Bible tells us clearly we're to walk by faith, not by sight. It's impossible to please God because he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, and you can only seek him through faith. So in the world's eyes, when I give of something that I have, in the natural mind, I have less. It represents a loss. When you give of your time, when you give of your money, you're thinking, I am forfeiting the resources that can directly benefit me. Here's the number when we talk about tithing. You know how many people put a name on their tithe and go, that's a tithe. You know what I could do with that money? You know what I could do with this money? I could, I could buy a house, I could buy a boat, I could buy a, a car, I could upgrade this, I could do that. And suddenly we're walking with natural eyes and natural thinking instead of walking in a generous spirit. Now, I'm gonna trouble some of you because a lot of people have a definition of generosity that is not biblically based. I'm gonna tell you what generosity is. It's a paradox. Luke 6, 38 Luke 6, 38, Jesus said this. I'm gonna use the big guns, all right? I'm just gonna quote the Son of God. He says, give, and it will be given to you. What? That doesn't make sense. I'm losing time, I'm losing money, I'm losing resources. How is that going to come back to me? Because you are walking in a kingdom realm, not a carnal realm. You're subject to different rules. Different spiritual laws. Put it this way. Given it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will it be put into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Yeah. All right. So, okay, it's time to give. Offering plate comes. Oh, let me see what I, let me see what I can give. Really, what that means is, let me see what I don't need, but I can put it in here and make, make myself feel better and not look as though I'm not doing anything. That's right. That's right. You know how many empty offering envelopes get licked and put in the offering bucket week after week after week? Now, I give online. I never use an offering envelope. But some people have a mindset <clears throat> clunk because their giving is unto men and so what happens is when we look and see what we don't need and we put it in there and then we wonder well how come you know that stuff doesn't work because I put something in I didn't see anything come back into my life because the Bible says the measure that you gave is the measure you got back if you give something that you didn't miss you're going to get something that you're going to miss Well, let's just move on to Proverbs 11.24. This is really a good sermon. I'll tell you why. Because I really had to go before God and say, do I really have to preach this sermon this way today? Because I want to be liked. I want to be popular. I want to be quoted on Facebook. And God said, I don't care about any of that. I just want you to say what I want you to say. Okay. Proverbs 11.24. Give freely and become more wealthy. What? You say that to somebody that's not born again, they're like, what? That doesn't make sense. I'm seeing some of you that give freely, and I see the, the smiles on your face because you know how true it is. Be stingy and lose everything. Come on, what do you really own on this planet? Come, come on, what do you really own? Just, just tell me, I own a phone. No, you don't. If you don't pay the bill, they're going to turn it off. And now it's just a broken piece of junk that you're carrying around to look fashionable. 
What do you really own? I own a house. Do you? Do you? Are you going to be buried in your house? You know what? You know what you own? The only thing that you take with you is what you own when you die. Your spirit. That's the only thing you take with you when you die. So what do you really own? What are you really investing in that really has no eternal value? Verse 25 says, the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others themselves will be refreshed. In other words, the science of this boils down to what Jesus is saying. It's more blessed to give than receive. Happiness is not spending more money on oneself, but rather giving money away to others that are in need. So, you know, and I'm not talking about necessarily giving to panhandlers and things like, things like that. I think we need to be very cautious where we give our money. Yeah. Because it's seed. And be sure, when you plant your seed, you want to make sure it's going in good soil. Yeah. And you know what? I'm looking, when Pastor Lori and I, and we run into all types of people that are going through walks of life, and people in dire straits, but we know they're faithful to God, they're plugged in, they're serving, da, da, da. I will bend over, I will do jumping jacks till I'm falling over to help them. I will, I will, we will sacrifice, we will do whatever it takes. Why? Because I know it's good seed and a good soil going in the right place. You see, people actually grow by giving themselves away. Yeah. And here we go, here we go. We are so commercialized. Christmas, we come to this and kids get asked this question. I think we all know what this question is. What do you want for Christmas? Am I right or am I right? Balcony? Takes a while for my words to get way up there, I guess. <laughs> what do you want for Christmas? We automatically program our children when they're young to think about getting, 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 getting. There's nothing wrong with getting, having a nice Christmas and being blessed and things like that. But what if we could turn it around biblically and say, son, daughter, what do you want to give for Christmas? Amen. Who do you want to bless? Would you be willing to go with uh, fewer presents under the tree? to make somebody else and their Christmas nice that's in a desperate situation. Amen. See, it, it's a change of a mindset, but, but here it is. It's easy to have a wish list or a want list, but generous people have a give list. They have a give list. I want to give to this. I want to give this much this year. I, I know what I want to give to Nepal, February 4th, 4th. I know what I want to give. I know what I want to give. I'm not, Lord, what do you want me to give? I know what I want to give. I have determined in my heart what I want to give, and it's not what I've got. <laughs> All right. So let me put it this way. If you give something that costs you nothing, then you've really given nothing. Anybody been to the DOL? Dep oh, no, DMV, Department of Motor Vehicles. We took Chase to go get his, his driver's permit on Friday. Be quiet. And, um, <laughs> and they ask one question. When you renew your driver's license, when you get your driver's license, get your learner's permit, they ask this question. Do you want to be an organ donor? Yeah, I want to be an organ donor. Thank you. And we walk around. We got owner, Dorgan, Dorgan owner, <laughs> organ donor on the back, check marked. We're walking around. I got my new license. See, see, I'm going to donate everything. My eyeballs, my intestines. I'm going to give my three teeth. I'm just going to be so generous when I die. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So many people have organ donor thinking when it comes to generosity. Because in reality, when you die, do you still need your organs? What are you really given? How about giving up a kidney right now while you're still alive and kicking? That would be generous. You understand? That would be giving of yourself. Now, I'm going to talk about the tithe today. I'm going to talk about the tithe. The tithe is what? 10% of your increase. Whatever comes in, that's the tithe. Now, if you're new to church, you kick back um, and just listen along because I'm going to challenge some people today. 
Malachi 3, 8 says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but say, wherein have you robbed me? In tithes and offerings. Now, let me explain this because I think a lot of people have the, the sense of what a generous person is wrong. Anybody heard of Robin Hood? Robin Hood, dun, 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 right? And he's got the bow and arrow, and, right? Robin Hood, what does Robin Hood do? He takes from the rich and he gives to the poor. He is so generous. Wait, wait, wait. Isn't he taking it and, and he's giving it? He's a giver. He's generous. No, what did he do? He went and he took what wasn't his and he gave what wasn't his to someone else and he's taking the credit for it. I am the man. I am Robin Hood. You see the principle here. Takes what isn't his, gives it to someone else and takes credit for it. God says, will a man rob God? Well, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings. What does that mean? Well, if you're not tithing, and you're giving and you feel generous, you are not generous until you start tithing. Because tithing is the basis of honor to God. And it's interesting because so many born again Christians struggle with the, with the fact of doing anything financially for God. They, they wanna chip it up as, oh, the church is money hungry. Of course we are, why, why? Money means souls. It doesn't mean another Bentley. I don't even have one. <laughs> I drive a Subaru. <laughs> I don't have any Birkenstocks though, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> if I'm up here preaching to Birkenstocks, you just need to leave to say, oh, he's lost it. <laughs> you yeah, know, we're going to Nepal. If we raise a $15,000 budget, we can do $15,000 of impact. If we raise $30,000 a budget, we can do $30,000 impact. Do you see? Then people say, well, you're money hungry. Of course, because money means everything in impacting the gospel. I don't know if you know this, but there are 13 furnaces and 13 air conditioners in this church. How many you got at your house? One, and it's probably this big, right? These are half the size of your room. And every time that guy comes out, he costing money. So you can be warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And people think, do you know the expense that goes into maintaining something like this so people can come and have their lives changed and souls saved and, and marriages healed? And people say, well, but here's the deal. People take that and they'll, they'll look at that 10% and you know what I could do with that? Well, I'll give this to Nepal. I'll give this to save the cats. Dear God. Dear God. And they're walking around going, I'm so generous. You know what you've done? You've taken what was God's and you gave it to someone else and you took credit for it. Well, let's go to New Testament then, okay? Because 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says, on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when, it come, when I come, no collections will have to be made. There are some people that don't do anything for the kingdom of God, but yet they want to reap the benefits of being in the house of God. Now, I want you to see this, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is talking about receiving the Lord's Supper or communion. Eat of the bread, drink of the cup. And, and we pick it up, verse 29, it says, for those of you who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. I'm gonna stop right there. One of the first things we do anytime that we have communion, I say, for instructions, we serve open communion to any born-again believer. You don't have to belong to this church. You understand? But you do need to be a born-again believer. Right? Other words, you're taking of it in an unworthy manner. Right? 
and you're eating and drinking judgment on yourself. But Paul is not speaking to the unbeliever. He's speaking to the believer. Those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Discerning the body. The body. What is the body of Christ? It's us. We're the church. The church is the body of Christ. He's the head. We're the body. And what does that mean? Discerning the body of Christ. It literally means in the Greek, they waver, they doubt or hesitate to fulfill their responsibilities as being a part of the body. We all, being born in the family of God, have responsibilities. But I'm saved by grace. Praise God, you're saved by grace. But now you're saved to do good works. You're saved to be a part of the body and help out. How many, how many parents expect your kids to fold clothes, take out the garbage, sweep, vacuum, pick up after themselves? How many parents do that? Why? Because they're a part of a family. And there is responsibilities as a part of the family. And many people, well, I don't have to do that because I'm under grace. Well, I want to ask you, are you really saved? If you have that attitude to take the blood of Jesus that has been so preciously poured out for you and to, and to just say that it's mine and it doesn't cost me anything. People do not understand the responsibility of the body of Christ. And you know what? The problem is the sin of a few in disobedience affects the whole body. Amen. You know, if, if somebody in your household makes a stupid landmark decision, it affects everybody in your home. Yes. I don't care if it's drugs. I don't care if it's, it's work-related or getting fired or whatever. It affects everybody. When, when God took the children of Israel out of Egypt, brought, and they're in the wilderness, and they're coming to the promised land, and the first city, they were to, they were to overcome 10 cities. And the first city was Jericho. Now, you see, 10 cities, the first city was Jericho. What's a tithe? Out of 10, one. The first city was God's. And God said, you attack that city, I've given you the city, but don't take anything from it. And one man, Achan, went in and he took a gold ingot and he took it and he hid it under his tent after they destroyed Israel or destroyed Jericho. And after Achan took that gold ingot, the entire nation of Israel was judged. How can that be? Because so many times we think that our disobedience or our unwillingness doesn't affect others. It does. It does. <laughs> When we think about this, when you don't understand your responsibility and you shirk your responsibility in the body of Christ, the Bible says that is why many of you are weak, sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep, died before your time. Because you are not upholding your responsibilities. And I see people with chronic challenges. And they wonder, how come I can't get over it? Check your heart. Is God first? Is he your source? It wears your faith. We are called to walk by faith, not by sight. So I want to show you this. Bring this table out for me, please. Bring this table. This is a really good example to show you the importance of the vision that God has given the church. God established the church. Right? It's his thing. We didn't start church. He started church. And how do you think church functions? People serving and people giving, right? That's how it works. Do you know, now they're just bringing a table out. It's not a glass table. You guys can run. You can hurry. There's somebody that's got to get to the buffet in time. By the way, do you know Golden Corral is coming in where Old Country Buffet is? Yeah! All right. See how I just changed the subject like that? All right. Here's... Here's the church, the body of Christ, okay? I need a body. We are not gonna have a seance. We're not bringing snakes out. Everybody calm down. Lay down up here. This is a really good example. Is your head heavier than your toes? Okay, maybe. There you go. Right there, okay. So she represents the body of Christ. And the body of Christ, it's amazing how little is happening in the body of Christ. How little? Do you know, George Barner reported that only 3% of those that profess to be born again actually tithe. 
3%. And we wonder why the church isn't stronger. We wonder why the music isn't better. We wonder what's wrong with the children. We wonder what's wrong with the country. Why do we have this going on? Why do we vote that in? And the church can't move. Because there's people in the church that want to do it, but they can't do it all. You guys, go ahead. Lift her up. Lift her up. Ah, right on. Okay. So this is a new CrossFit training. Pretty easy, huh? But God did not call you guys to carry the whole weight of the body. So go ahead and put her down. I just, I want you to just take your, take how many fingers you got, including your thumbs. Ten. You're a thumb buddy. You're a thumb buddy, okay? Everybody, get your hands up. Ten. Now, what's a tithe? One. So you guys just take your tithe and lift her up. Go ahead. You, you don't weigh that much. I do. Oh. Okay. All right. All right. In other words, they cannot carry the weight of the vision by themselves. I, I just need some women to come up. Lisa, come on. Amy, Ruth, come on. I need some lady, ladies. Miss Naomi, Pastor Naomi, LaFonda. Come on. Oh, you can't. Um, you got the baby. Come on, Justine. Hey, you can help too. This is good. Go shoulder to shoulder, shoulder to shoulder. I'm going to stand up here. Get, get in there. Two more, two more. Now just gather around. Now, great. Okay. Now just take one finger and on three, just lift nice and easy. One, two, three, lift. Right? Now put her down easily. Thank you. You've, you can be seated. Thank you. God wants his body to move. And right now the body of Christ is like, right? You know, Jesus is like, I want to go over there. And we're like, 3% of us is working. I, I, I'm just trying to make this as practical as possible. Because we are a generous culture. And I guarantee you, if you are not generous, you're probably not going to hang around here much longer because th it, this stuff just gets on you. Yeah. It just gets in you. And it, it's just something about being able to think beyond yourself and say, I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to put God first because we don't get to decide how to honor God. God already decided. He said the tithe is holy. That has never been undone. It's never been undone. Is God holy to you? Do you honor God? And when you honor God, no matter whether you're a base or a bound, whether you got a lot of money or whether you're going through challenges, you can stand in faith and know that God's going to get you through them. Hmm. That's all I got. That's all I got. The body of Christ. Lift the body. Raise the body. Imagine what we could do. If you're struggling, you, if you got that little, that, that little grindy feeling going on right now, it's because your spirit is saying this and your, your flesh is warring. Your flesh is worrying. Your flesh is like, I can't, I can't compute that. It's more blessed to give than receive. Given it shall be given. What? I, I just, I, I don't understand that. That's because we can't teach you tithing. It's caught. It's revelation. Amen. Why? When you face a financial challenge, not if, right? But when. Whether you caused it or something else caused it. If you caused it, you need to repent and make it right. But when you're honoring God, you don't have to sweat it. You don't have to worry. You don't have to wring your hands. You don't have to say, I don't know how we're going to make it through this. We're going to walk through it. It's all going to be okay. God's going to take us through it. And here's some reality check. Some people might need to downsize. Some people may have been moving in the flesh and they need to say, you know what? That's in the way of me being able to honor God. Amen. Those are God decisions. Those are faith decisions. I'm talking, this is varsity teaching. Yeah. This is not milk. If you're a baby Christian or if you're, if you're brand new to church and you're not saved, this is probably rocking your world. But we really believe in what we're doing. This is not a little club that we get together every week. We really believe that people are dying and going to hell every day. And if they don't hear about Jesus, they're going to go to hell. That's what this is about. Heaven or hell. 
Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. I just pray that you stir our hearts today. Just everybody bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're, if you're here and you're new and you're not born again, you're not serving God, and what does that mean? You know, the reality is, is just because you go to church doesn't mean you're saved, doesn't mean you're gonna go to heaven. What does it mean? If God says, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? Well, I'm a good person, or I, I got christened as a child. What, what reasoning would you give? Because Jesus said this to a, a very knowledgeable man, Nicodemus, in the Bible. He said, you must be born again. What does that look like? It means that you have to realize that you're born into sin and you cannot save yourself. You see, this is how we yield to the mercy of God. This is how we say, God, be merciful to me. Forgive me, a sinner. Forgive me. Come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. You see, it's a heart action, not a mind action. It's a heart action. And we have worked so hard week after week, and you're, you're not here by accident. You weren't here by accident to hear what I'm saying to you today. Jesus can save your soul. Jesus can give you eternal life, but you have to make the decision. So if that's you and you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you want to be born again, or maybe you've drifted off and you ran off, but it's time to come home. Ha <laughs> ha, this is your day. This is your day. Here it is. I'm going to count to three. When I say three, I'm going to clap my hand. And if that's you and you want to renew your faith or you want to come to Jesus for the very first time, all you got to do right now is just lift your hand up right now. That's all it looks like. I'm going to count to three. Clap my hand. You shoot your hand up and it'll change your life. Here it is. One, two, three. Anyone at all? Yes, I see that hand. Praise the Lord. Someone else? Anyone else? Looking in the balcony? All right. Praise the Lord. Sister, you raised your hand. Is that right? All right. One over here. You know, oh, thank you. It's really dark back there. So here's the deal. Jesus said, if you confess me before others, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Amen. If you deny me before others, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. I'm going to give you that opportunity to meet me right here. This is the safest place on the planet to say, I want Jesus. That's all you gotta do. So I want everybody to stand and those that raise their hand, I want you to come and meet me right here, right now. Just come right, yes, yep, yep, that's right. Come on, come. Yes, come on, give him a hand. Right. This is how you know it's real. I'm right here. I'm right here. What's your name? Elizabeth. Elizabeth, and your name? Monica. Monica. This is to make it real. I want you to pray this, make, make these words your words, okay? Just close your eyes and say this with me out loud. Church, say it with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of all my sins. I accept your son Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Wash me clean. And Jesus, I serve you. Grow in my life. Help me to hear your voice. In Jesus' name. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.